Good morning. Greetings to everyone. Good morning. I welcome everyone to the first annual Transforming Cardiac Rehabilitation Symposium. It's a great CME event. Uh, as a host of team, we work together to bring every one of us here. I am Jonathan David, your uh, partner in Transforming Cardiac Rehabilitation. I am a nurse. Uh, inpatient cardiac rehab nurse coordinator. We are excited that you all could join us today. I want to share our total engagement today, the total number of uh, 1,051 um, participants across 51 countries that are here today with us. Um, also want to share at, during the lunch break, we would have opportunity to connect with the frontline cardiac rehab teams that we can engage in uh, and discuss. So with that, in, with that um, information, I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Abba Kandawal, our course director for the CME event. And she is also the chief uh, ambulatory uh, outpatient clinic of cardiovascular medicine. She's also section chief for general cardiology her practice areas are women's heart health, uh, lipoprotein A, and she's also the advisory board director for the HeartFit for Life. She'll be the event moderator. I'm so excited. Um, I have the pleasure to invite Dr. Kandawal and she will take it from here. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Jonathan, for the kind introduction. I'm very excited that today is finally here. Um, I am also just completely uh, excited to see the engagement for our CME from all over the world. I think this is a direct result of the caliber of faculty that we have speaking today. The last few years have impacted our healthcare industry in a variety of ways. But truly, cardiac rehab has had to really adapt and transform to be able to continue to serve its patients. Um, I really think that how we transform and reimagine ourselves from these hardships is how we define who we're going to be as a community. And we will learn about this more as the day goes on. Uh, a couple housekeeping items. For the CME, please make sure to log in to the Zoom using the email that you registered with. And for an optimal experience, please place the Zoom view in speaker view. There will be um, further instructions if needed in the chat on how to do this. Um, moving on, the structure for the day will include both individual and panel talks. The Q&A will remain open and we will do the best we can to answer as many questions after the talks are complete. For those that aren't answered right after the, the talks, we will continue to answer them through the Q&A. Um, and then Jonathan already uh, let you know about the lunch break uh, session, and I strongly encourage our frontline providers to attend. Um, and as, we, as I said, we have a very informative day planned for you. So to start off our journey, I'd like to invite Nancy Houston Miller and Barbara Fagan to turn on their cameras. Um, briefly, I'm going to just in, uh, start talking about uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Nancy Houston Miller. She currently serves as the director and chief clinical officer for Life Care, which is a nursing management business for patients with complex medical problems. She has spent over three decades with Stanford Medicine and is the former associate director of the Stanford Cardiac Rehab Program for Research. She was one of the founders of the Preventative Cardiovascular Nurses Association and is also a past president and she conducted and oversaw many NIH trials with, multi, with a multidisciplinary team that was dedicated to prevention and rehabilitation of patients with coronary heart disease. She is also one of the developers of the well-known multi-fit program for home-based cardiac rehab. I would also like to briefly introduce um, Barbara Fagan. She is currently the executive director for Channel Health and has over 30 years of experience in wellness and prevention care management. Among her many accomplishments, she was this past president of the American Association of Cardiovascular Pulmonary Rehabilitation, 
as we also know as AACVPR. And Barbara is not only committed her professional life to wellness, she lives her own life with the same vigor and dedication. She has completed 75 marathons, 16 Ironman triathlons, multiple ultra marathons, including 100 mile run and most recently CrossFit competitions. I believe Nancy will start us off with a perspective on how cardiac rehab began. I want to welcome all of you from across the world. And indeed, it's an incredible pleasure for me to be the first speaker today talking about cardiac rehabilitation. When and how did it begin? I am, uh, these are our disclosures for Barb and myself. And I want to begin by saying that there are a few good uh, new. Uh, papers that have recently come out um, on the history of cardiac rehabilitation worldwide. And I have, am indebted to Julie Redford and her colleagues from Australia. We have been corresponding and I ask for permission to take a, um, some of what she has published in April of this year regarding um, what led to cardiac rehabilitation. And as we know, uh, the development of the coronary circulation was defined in the 17th century, but it was not until the 19th century that there was a link between coronary artery disease occlusion and myocardial infarction. And unfortunately, um, in the first half of the 20th century, up until about the 1950s, most patients, as you recognize, were required to be at bed rest for up to six weeks, uh, severely limiting their physical activity. But in about 1952, Levine and Laun actually began to explore what it was like getting patients up to a into a chair for one to two hours. And finally, in the 1960s, um, with the work of Herman Hellerstein, who is often known as the grandfather of cardiac rehabilitation, and other groups around the world who were doing research into exercise training, it was recognized that regular exercise um, should be used in order to overcome the effects of prolonged bed rest. In the 1970s, and in the United States, it was about 1970 and 71, we began to see cardiac rehabilitation emerge. The first types of programs were not necessarily what we term phase two, but they were group-based programs, primarily in gymnasiums. And they were in areas of the country such as Washington, D.C., Seattle, and even Palo Alto, as you will hear later today. Terry Cavanaugh up in Canada began marathons with patients with coronary heart disease. So there were things that were going on that allowed us to see the benefits of exercise training worldwide. And by the mid-1970s, cardiac rehab programs emerged in 25 countries. In the 1970s, the Framingham Heart Study also came into play and or came into being and began to identify risk factors for both primary and secondary prevention of coronary cardiovascular disease. The Framingham Heart Study continues in its 40th year of operation. This is a very uh, important slide taken from Julie's work, and it also shows you that in the 1970s and the 1980s, bypass surgery began to emerge, and there were a proliferation not only of hospital-based programs, but group-based programs across the world. And then in the early 1990s, we began to see PCI. We saw shortened hospital stays, patients with myocardial infarction staying in the hospital only three to five days. But what we did see was we saw a continuation of the same type of traditional program uh, of cardiac rehabilitation that was largely unchanged despite PCI, our advanced secondary prevention medicines, and short hospital stays. Now people have, are, are very familiar with the fact that we have categorized rehab into phases, phase one being inpatient and introductory education. The most common type of program around the world is a phase two program, which occurs over six to 12 weeks. 
and there are fewer maintenance programs which continue cardiac rehabilitation and risk factor modification um, as uh, over a period of four to six months or beyond. Unfortunately, in the United States, private health insurance really continues to proliferate this model, which was really developed in the 1970s through research that was conducted by exercise physiologists, primarily indicating that if patients exercised two to three times per week over approximately three months, there would be an increase in uh, cardiac uh, fitness. But the real question is, isn't secondary prevention lifelong? And despite our coverage and our guideline recommendations in the United States, only 34% of patients that are referred enroll in programs, 16% of Medicare patients and only 10% of the VA population. And as we know, there are huge disparities with 36% of women less likely to be enrolled and black, Hispanic and Asian populations also being underserved compared to whites. Well, I will say worldwide, there has been a, a, a silver lining as a result of COVID. Um, this has enabled us um, to really look at how can we begin to reconfigure and transform cardiac rehabilitation. This is also due to a lack of services to all patients, the need for lifelong prevention, as well as emerging technologies, which will enable us in the 21st century to deliver and to emerge with new programming as part of the history of cardiac rehabilitation. This is a study that was undertaken in 2019 worldwide, looking at phase two cardiac rehabilitation programs, which as I mentioned, are the most common type of program worldwide, with 83% offering exercise training, and a much lower percentage offering either home-based or community-based models. The average patients that are seen per session are nine, and it has been said in this paper that lack of flexibility is a major barrier to program participation. The sad thing was that during the pandemic, over 4,400 programs, 75% worldwide, either ceased or temporarily stopped due to COVID-19 and we hope the majority of them are back up in operation. Well, I don't wanna to talk too much more about the history. I wanna talk about the challenge of the 21st century, which in my mind comes down to one word, and that is innovation. When we began to put slides together, we were given a template by um, Stanford to really look at which template we wanted to use to put our slides in. And one of those templates was the Stanford Medicine Mission. And I think it's extremely important for us to recognize how timely this mission statement is to what we're attempting to do in transforming cardiac rehabilitation. Through innovative discovery and the translation of new knowledge, we improve human health locally and globally. We provide outstanding and compassionate health care, serving the needs of our local community as well as our patients from around the globe. And finally, we inspire and prepare the future leaders of science and medicine. Now, there is never enough time for all of the research that needs to be done in cardiology and every other discipline in healthcare. But I would suggest, folks, that some of the science and much of the science has been undertaken for us to look at innovative models. There was a Cochrane review of exercise-based traditional rehabilitation a few years ago showing a 25% reduction in cardiovascular mortality and an 18% reduction in hospitalization. The COURAGE trial, followed by the ischemia trial, showed us that medical treatment with intensive risk factor management is as efficacious as coronary heart disease intervention procedures in reducing cardiovascular events. The HF Action trial, which was the largest study ever taken in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, showed that traditional cardiac rehabilitation for three months and home training for up to two years, while not statistically significant, still showed an 11% lower risk of all-cause mortality 
and of heart or heart failure hospitalization with the safety being proven for exercise training in this population. And finally, as we know, there's a Cochrane review of home-based exercise training compared to traditional cardiac rehab, which is shown to be as effective in improving clinical outcomes and quality of life. So let's just take home-based cardiac rehabilitation and what do we know? Well, the value and the benefit of home-based rehab started in the late 1970s and the early 1980s. And there are many randomized controlled trials looking at the benefits of home training. It's not only been undertaken, as I mentioned, in the heart failure population, but in those with coronary heart disease and valvular heart disease. And we've known for years since the 1970s that care management primarily provided by nurses, but also by exercise physiologists and by pharmacists, which involves education and behavioral counseling and the oversight of patients in terms of there, it has, has proven the success of home-based cardiac rehab. But what we must continue to work on is to ensure that the traditional rehab model in which we are funding rehab for 36 sessions over three months gets revised to include telehealth services, which are now reimbursed for home training at least through 2023, and as Karen Louie will tell us, hopefully beyond. And we need to look at other mechanisms to expand reimbursement for home-based cardiac rehab. This is the Cochrane Review of 17 randomized controlled trials published in 2015, which has been updated in 2017, showing the value of home training equally be, being equally effective in terms of improving clinical outcomes as well as quality of life. And 30, almost 40 years later, AACVPR, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology under the direction of our next speaker, Dr. Randy Thomas, put out a scientific statement looking at the value of home-based rehab, which was co-published in three journals. With a very important figure showing the interventions that are so critically important for secondary prevention, with the targeted behaviors of healthy eating, medication adherence, smoking, total smoking cessation, leading to our intermediate outcomes as we know, including the psychosocial outcomes of a reduction in anxiety and depression that then move, move us to our secondary uh, prevention goals of an improvement in physical fitness, functional capacity, as well as quality of life. But most importantly, leading to a reduction in cardiovascular events and, and cost and resource savings. Well, what are the challenges and the opportunities that are offered by the 21st century? First of all, it's a greater need to manage equity and diversity. If we look worldwide, 90% of the cardiovascular burden is in low to middle income countries with large populations. Our traditional type of approach to cardiac rehabilitation will never meet all of the demands of those with cardiovascular disease. In addition, the digital era really allows us to communicate and to interact on different levels. 60% of the world now has internet access and 80% of the world, uh, world's individuals own a smartphone. And certainly uh, the silver lining, the COVID pandemic has necessitated a change in the way in which we deliver care from face-to-face -face models to hybrid and virtual models potentially of care delivery. I started with the excellent article by Julie Redfern, and I'm going to end with it by looking at how can history move us forward. Certainly, we need to consider programming in which there is implementation of lifelong preventive strategies. Do we need to extend rehab for a much, much longer period of time? Should we not only consider one type of model, but have flexibility in our delivery models from intensive programming such as that of Ornish, Ornish and Pritikin to our traditional models that we see around the world to considering hybrid and virtual opportunities? How wonderful would it be if every program had three to four different methods 
of delivering cardiac rehab. There needs to be systematic incorporation of cardiac rehab into performance measures, certainly with digital integration and automatic referral. We need to consider at all levels that secondary prevention involves a comprehensive focus on risk factor management, not just exercise training, and it needs to be integrated in many different ways into program development. When we look at our technology, such as our digital um, health interventions, such as telephone coaching, text messaging, smartphone apps, and sensors, we need to recognize that we need to continue to do research on the effectiveness and the usefulness of these interventions for patients. We certainly, as I've already mentioned, need to improve access and implementation in low to middle income countries. And we need to look at the widespread global availability of our technologies, which we have in many languages today. We need to advocate for suitable reimbursement and funding for flexible models. And Karen Louie will be talking about this in her presentation. And as Dr. Redfern and colleagues said, should we not revisit the word rehabilitation to perhaps secondary prevention, which I use all the time, or preventive cardiology? Finally, it is my belief that we need to have the foresight now to see change as innovative and to create unique programs and be able to support the millions of patients who need our care. I often end presentations with quotes, and as I see it, innovation is change. Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not fighting the old, but building on the new. And my favorite from an ancient Chinese proverb, when the winds of change blow, some people build walls and others build windmills. I challenge all of you, as you continue over the next couple of decades working in this field, to build as many windmills as is possible. Thank you. I will now turn this over to my dear colleague, Bart Fagan. Thanks, Nancy. That was a wonderful recap of the science and birth of cardiac rehab. But what we know is that science alone wasn't going to get us to where we are today, that we needed a home, that we needed a profession dedicated to advancing the science of cardiac rehab. So how did we come to be? I had the pleasure of having a warm summer afternoon chat with one of my idols, Barry Franklin. We talked about one of his idols, the late great Mike Pollock, and his influence on the creation of AACVPR. In the late 1970s, Mike Pollock was hosting meetings on heart disease and rehab, and there was overwhelming interest and participation at those meetings. At the same time, Mike was out to determine whether or not we needed a journal focused on that same topic. And based on the analysis of the literature, of the benefits of cardiac rehab, Dr. Pollock identified a gap that a new journal could fill. He recruited Dr. Victor Froelicher to be his co-editor for the very first issue. And in 1981, Drs. Pollock and Froelicher released the inaugural issue of JCRP, which at that time was known as the Journal of Cardiac Rehabilitation. Many professionals interested in cardiac rehab and the science behind it were members of the American College of Sports Medicine. Heck, I remember being in grad school, attending the ACSM conference and trying to hit every single session on cardiac rehab that I could find. But what I didn't know what was what was happening behind the scenes. There was a profession dedicated to cardiac rehab and the clinicians that cared for our patients being curated. And in, 19, in 1985, AACVPR was born. Phil Wilson was our appointed first founding president. There are many people to thank for having the vision to create this incredible organization. Barry Franklin, Kathy Barra, Phil Wilson, Mike Pollock, Nanette Wenger, Nancy Houston Miller, Linda Hall, Murray Lowe, the list is long. 
It was at a Barry Franklin presentation that I first heard the quote from Isaac Newton. If I have seen further than others, it is by standing upon the shoulders of giants. We have many giants in our profession that paved the way for us to do what we do. And I am forever grateful to all of these individuals. Here's just a snapshot of some of our founding presidents. And again, we have Phil Wilson, Mark, Will Phil Wilson, Mark Williams, Linda Hall, uh, Reed Humphrey, Kathy Barra, L. Kent Smith, Bill Bell, Barry Franklin, Pat Kamas. And we know that the mission statement of an organization is the summary of our goals and values. Our statement aligns and unifies the efforts of all of our members towards our long-term goal. What we knew then and continue to move forward now is our dedication to reducing morbidity, mortality, and disability from cardiovascular and pulmonary disease. We do this through education, prevention, rehabilitation, research, and disease management. And as Nancy said, and I will from my lens, also innovation. So I want to take you through a very short trip down memory lane with some of the highlighted milestones of AACVPR. There are many, and these are but a few. And what was fun for me, since I've been working in this field since 1987 as an exercise physiologist, is that I lived all of these my milestones. And I remember, as I'm sure many of you do, some of these highlights. So as I mentioned, the journal was born before AACVPR. And in 1986, it was renamed the Journal of Cardiopulmonary Rehabilitation and it, become, it became AACVPR's uh, professional journal. That same year, we had our first annual meeting just outside of Dallas, Texas. And in late September, we will be having our 37th annual meeting in West Palm Beach. I sure hope I see some of you there. Um, AACVPR began to become involved in advocacy in 1989 and played a key role in HICFA, the Healthcare Finance Administration, as we were challenging the tightening of requirements for reimbursement of cardiac rehab. And at that time, our efforts allowed or, or really pursued, pushed, a, pushed HICFA to rescind its decision that a physician must actually be in the room during an exercise session. So could you imagine if that's where we were today? In 1991, our first edition of the program guidelines were released, offering programs information on policies, procedures, techniques, and the state-of-the-art clinical practice. If this is not on your shelf, it needs to be. We are now in our sixth edition. And as we continue to move forward in the science of cardiac rehab, AACVPR received a significant grant of over $1 million to create our clinical practice guidelines. And in 1995, those clinical practice guidelines were released. Also of note in 1995, our journal with Barry Franklin, now editor, received notification from the National Library of Medicine that it was improved in Index Medicus. Barry shared with me that twice they were turned down when Mike and Vic were editors, and once again, when Barry reapplied. The fourth time was a charm. Why? Barry went to Washington, D.C. and had a face-to-face -face meeting where he was given five minutes to make his case, and he did. Barry's message to all of us is that when you are in pursuit of something important, don't send emails, don't make a phone call, get a face-to-face -face meeting. President, past President John Hodgkin convinced the AACVPR board that we needed advocacy presence. And in 1996, AACVPR retained GRQ led by Phil Port. And as many of you know, past president Karen Louie joined GRQ in 2006, working side by side with Phil for many, many years. Phil has since retired and I would like to publicly thank him for his leadership and all he did 
to advance cardiac rehab on the Hill. As you know, Karen now leads the AACVPR advocacy efforts with her company, Advocates for Action. In 1998, AACVPR launched program certification where that year we had 168 cardiac and 101 pulmonary rehab programs achieve certification. Today, we have just under 2,000 total certified programs. And in 2002, two of our organization's most prestigious awards were established, recognizing excellence in our field. They were named in honor and memory of L. Kent Smith and Michael Pollack. Our advocacy efforts were fully underway and AACVPR had assured that we had a seat at the table discussing reimbursement and other regulatory issues. In 2004, we held our first day on the Hill, which gave our members an opportunity to speak to their senators, congressmen and congresswomen on the importance of advancing specific skills. 2007, performance measures, for referral to cardiac rehab were created. And in 2012, we launched our first outpatient cardiac rehab data registry. Today in 2022, we have just shy of 1 million patient records, about 800,000 in cardiac and about 120,000 in pulmonary rehab. The heart failure HF action trial that Nancy shared led to one of my most memorable milestones, which was the inclusion of heart failure as an eligible diagnosis for cardiac rehab. But gang, we have a lot of work to do here as we are currently only capturing about 3% of eligible heart failure patients into our programs. In 2014, championed by Karen Louie, we launched the Certified Cardiac Rehab Professional Credential. Today, we have just over 1,000 CCRPs delivering care for our patients. Program certification began measuring more outcomes, quality over task completion. In 2008, our Action Act, giving non-physician practitioners the ability to meet the CMS requirements of direct supervision uh, was enacted. We are waiting patiently for January 1 of 2024 for this to go live. Also in 2018, I think an, a landmark release was with along with the CDC and the Million Hearts, AACVPR released the change package, which I believe is one of the most rich evidence-based resources we have. If you are unfamiliar with it, you got to go find it and take a look at it. And as most of you are aware, this, this past year, we have two new performance measures addressing referral, enrollment, and engagement. They will be included in the 2023 program certification application. So what's next? We must keep advancing the science. We must continue to be engaged in AACVPR and the roadmap that they so eloquently laid out for all of us. But most importantly, we must be innovative and explore new delivery models of care that allow us to reach more patients. Nancy shared where the science has brought us to today, and you will hear next from Randy as he shares future visions. What's next for AACVPR, for us, for our patients? How will you contribute? AACVPR is the bedrock of what we do. And now here's my plug. If you are not a member, become one. I'm going to share some wisdom from Barry Franklin. He said, quote, work early in your career with people that you want to emulate. Work with the stars and you have to join your professional association. You have to be active. So what started out with perhaps an idea on the back of a napkin by visionaries that saw a need a better way has blossomed into an amazing organization dedicated to serve those that serve our patients. I am grateful for those that paved the way, grateful for having the opportunity to lead and grateful for those who move us forward. But to make AACVPR truly successful, we also rely 
and those that guided our board, our executive directors. Thank you to these five women that held the lantern as we paved the way. Jane Shepard, Marie Bass, Joanne Ray, Megan Cohen, and Molly Corbett. And finally, I reached out to two friends and colleagues to hear their thoughts on AACVPR. Past President Ann Gavick said, AACVPR and its leadership has pushed me, often outside of my comfort zone, to think and do things differently, to always ask why. She said that when all is said and done, perhaps the most important thing that I carry with me from AACVPR is the enduring friendships that I have made. And our current president, Amy Knight, calls AACVPR her home, her primary organization, because she said, quote, it does all the things, educates, advocates, and connects. But what struck me most is when she said, quote, there is some kind of magic that comes out of us when we are all together for the cause of improving care for our patients. She said she's endlessly inspired by the passion and commitment of the people involved with AACVPR, and she is honored to be able to do her part to continue the work. There could be no definition of a successful life that does not include service to others. Thank you to my colleague, Nancy Houston Miller, Stanford Medicine, the rest of today's speakers, and to all of you that make up our cardiac rehab community. Have a great day of learning, connecting, and being inspired to innovate. Thanks. Thank you so much, Nancy and Barbara, for that beautiful walk through the history and how far we've come. Next, I'm uh, going to ask Dr. Randall Thomas to um, come to the screen. I'm actually delighted that he agreed to speak for us today. Dr. Thomas is a professor of medicine in the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic, Alex School of Medicine, and a consultant for the Division of Pre Preventative Cardiology. His clinical and research activities are particularly focused in cardiac rehab, and some of his early roots in cardiac rehab can be traced back to Stanford, where he spent some time during his training as a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar in our preventative cardiology uh, fellowship. He's also the past president of AACVPR and the past chair of the American Heart Association Council on Clinical Cardiology. His research is well known to many of us on this webinar. It focuses on effectiveness, delivery, and quality improvement in cardiac rehabilitation. He has been looking at care delivery models in cardiac rehab well before the pandemic hit and was even writing about ethnocultural diversity in cardiac rehab over a decade ago. He published a review outlining 13 proposed recommendations to be considered by the CR community, and seven were related to policy and advocacy, as well as six for research and practice. I would strongly recommend, if you have not read it, to, to look at some of these works. In addition, he has worked with colleagues from around the world to help write scientific statements and guidelines related to uh, cardiac rehabilitation, and um, his ongoing work includes studies to identify new and improved methods for delivering cardiac rehab to patients in the United States and countries around the world. And I could go on about all of his amazing work, but I'd like for the interest of time to uh, ask Dr. Thomas to share with us the scientific underpinnings of cardiac rehab. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kandawal. I'll uh, go ahead and share my screen here. Thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure to be with you today. And uh, a great uh, opportunity to, to stroll down memory lane as well. As Dr. Kendall mentioned, uh, I traced my cardiac rehabilitation roots in part back to Stanford and some time I spent there with Nancy and Kathy Barra and Cindy Lamondola, you'll hear later from, and Bob Nabusk, Bill Haskell, Steve Fortman, Jack Farquhar, and David Marin, who uh, was training there at the time I was. What a wonderful place Stanford is, and what a great example of innovation over the, the, the past many years that they have given to the rest of the world. So it's great to be here with you today. It's great to see also so many people from around the, the world, and uh, welcome to colleagues from 
uh, countries around the world. Um, I, I hope that uh, you can find some uh, benefit from the, this um, this meeting. I know each of you are at a different point in the spectrum of developing and innovating in cardiac rehabilitation. And that's great. We learn from each other. And I, I learn from you as I get to interact with you around the world. I learned much from my colleagues, uh, Kim Chul in South Korea and in China, uh, Ding Rongjing and uh, Hu Dai, just among many, many others. I can't name, name them all. Uh, so, so great examples to us. So I've been asked to talk about scientific underpinnings of cardiac rehabilitation. Some of what I'll be covering has been covered by Nancy and Barb already. Um, they say repetition is the key to learning. So hopefully that will help with our learning today. Here are my disclosures. And uh, I come from Minnesota in the Northern part of the United States where you look on the weather map in the winter time, it's the part that's always in blue, the, the part that's really cold. They say you come to Minnesota for the culture and you stay because your car won't start. And uh, that's uh, unfortunately fairly true sometimes, so. It's great to be here for, for, uh, with you. I wish we could be in person together. I'd like to just say uh, in brief, uh, acknowledge the fact that we enjoy trees today because others planted seeds before us. And uh, lovely uh, uh, recognition that uh, Barb and Nancy have already made about the many, many people who have come before us that have made it possible for us to enjoy where we are today with cardiac rehabilitation. I'd like to acknowledge uh, locally, the people here at Mayo Clinic who have made it such a, a great uh, place for me to, to work for these past many years, uh, patients, staff, other leaders who have just been outstanding in helping us. I would say that many of our research questions actually come from our patients, and I think you probably have those same experiences, but thank you to all of them. I'd like to talk first of all about foundations of cardiac rehabilitation, which are key as we look at the underpinnings. We'll talk about the underpinnings and what that means exactly. And then we'll talk about some threats to cardiac rehabilitation and future opportunities. So underpinnings are structures that add support underneath a foundation. So the foundation being here in black. So these underpinnings in blue are very important for a number of reasons. Uh, they strengthen the original foundation. They adjust for new usage of the building. They also adjust for changes in the nearby soil and structures, either from natural disasters or otherwise. So these underpinnings help in many ways the, uh, the building to continue to, to thrive. And of course, this will be symbolic of cardiac rehabilitation as we talk about this today. Well, what are the foundations of cardiac rehabilitation? I'd like to put this in context a bit. If you go back to 1950 in the United States, Treatments for myocardial infarction were very limited. In fact, the leading textbook of the time by Paul Dudley White said there's no specific treatment for coronary disease per se. Treatments that were used include those that were listed. You see, including things like thyroidectomy for angina. Um, also mentioned previously by Nancy, bed rest for up to six months. They were trying everything they could because as they looked at the, the death rates from heart disease, you see this terrible rise in death rates from cardiovascular disease from 1900 to 1960. It was, it was to the point that nobody knew what to do, essentially. A lot of people trying to do good things, but there were treatment limitations and people, uh, professionals as well as patients were looking for a better way. So in that path came Lewis Connor in 1927, almost hundred years ago who was one of those who helped to found the American Heart Association uh, nearly 100 years ago, uh, started with activities in, in organizations in local areas in the United States. But he had this wonderful idea in 1927 about a plan for rehabilitation of the cardiac patient through an organized effort. And this included a number of things, outpatient clinics, special school classes for cardiac children, pediatric patients, uh, convalescent homes, et cetera. So just a, a, a great outline, which eventually helped to, to um, grow the American Heart Association in its mission, but a great thing for us to think about back at that time. Well, fast forward to 1952, uh, Levine and Laun uh, had a study that Nancy had mentioned 
uh, an armchair study. They thought this would be a revolutionary look instead of bed rest for six months. Let's put people at, at, uh, in their chair next to their bed for one to two hours a day and see what happens. And what they found was that the function, symptoms, and psychological health all improved. Now, it wasn't a randomized study, but it was an, a revolutionary study, I think, that helped us set a foundation for the principle that movement was good and doing things perhaps that would challenge the status quo would be important for finding solutions. Now, Paul Dudley White, who I mentioned, was uh, was instrumental in this also. In the 1950s and early 1960s, he helped to take care of Paul. He took care of Dwight Eisenhower, president of the United States, who suffered a heart attack while he was president. And while many physicians were advising Dr. President Eisenhower to stay at bed rest and to retire and to never play golf again, Paul Dudley White said, that's nonsense. You need to get back and do more activity. You need to quit smoking. And he helped him to get back to where he could run for president uh, for another off, another um, term of office. Uh, Paul Dudley White was famous for the quote, walk more, eat less, and sleep more, which still applies today. He was a great personal example of doing that, riding his bike around Boston, where he practiced for many, many years. When he passed away, this was part of an editorial in Boston that uh, that uh, highlighted his great career and showed him on his last house call, taking his bicycle uh, heavenward. In 1976 at the Mayo Clinic, a group of individuals, including John Cantwell, who was a fellow at that time, who was actually my uh, initial mentor in cardiac rehabilitation in Atlanta, they found that in a study of, of men with angina exercising at the local YMCA, that they could show improvements in angina control, self-esteem, functional capacity through an exercise regimen. So fairly revolutionary as well in 1976. Others who are challenging the status quo include those uh, organizations already mentioned, American Heart Association, sports medicine, uh, College of Sports Medicine, the AACVPR, uh, American College of Cardiology, international organizations and many others who helped us set the stage for many things that occurred, including policy guidelines and other um, programmatic efforts to really push forward uh, the work of cardiac rehabilitation. Now there was an advance in general cardiovascular care, which certainly helped with the advances in cardiovascular care, including coronary care units and better treatments for acute care, but also recognizing the importance of practice guidelines, performance metrics to improve the quality of the care we delivered. In cardiac rehabilitation, the development of core components, the identification of core components and implementing these core components, which have already been uh, um, discussed, have been a key part and a key step in the foundation work for cardiac rehabilitation. Changes in CMS coverage, as, as Barb has mentioned, uh, cardiac rehabilitation practice guidelines have also been key. Some initial ones through AACVPR and others through American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. And one that I would like to highlight that I think is, is a very important step forward from our colleagues in South Korea who developed evidence-based clinical practice guidelines for cardiac rehabilitation. Outstanding work by our colleagues in South, Carol South Korea who have helped uh, set a stage and, and, and um, uh, encourage us to, to move forward in evidence-based efforts. Performance metrics have also been uh, men mentioned for cardiac rehabilitation. I think one of the most important advances has been the uh, inclusion of cardiac rehabilitation uh, performance metrics and HEDIS, the, uh, measure, the performance measures here in the United States uh, that the National um, uh, Committee of Quality Assurance has uh, developed and implemented. And as mentioned, there are four different measures for initiation of rehabilitation, engagement one, which means finishing at least 12 sessions, engagement two, at least 24 sessions, and achievement, meaning uh, achieving at least 36 sessions of participation. This is a very important step. So what do we do? What have we been doing? We as a, a profession to strengthen those foundations through scientific uh, uh, inquiry. First of all, let me just go through a few landmark studies that have impressed me over the years that I think have been underpinnings 
to the Foundation for Cardiac Rehabilitation. First of all, regarding the benefits of rehabilitation activities, Collio and colleagues in 1979 published a study showing that an intervention, including inter exercise, nutrition, and smoking cessation, made a big difference in mortality rates and, and risk factor control. Oldridge and O'Connor, um, separate papers, but both doing meta-analyses uh, in the 1980s, showed by taking smaller randomized studies and a meta-analysis, they found a significant reduction in total and cardiovascular mortality beginning in year one of the intervention. Very important step forward. Schuler and colleagues did many studies. This is just one of them published in 1992 showing that through exercise training and low-fat diet, they could uh, demonstrate improvements in angina control, perfusion on imaging studies, and atheroma regression. So I and colleagues, another very important uh, landmark study, 2009 published in Jack, uh, that looked at Medicare data and found that those participants in rehabilitation after a cardiac event had a significant reduction in one and five year mortality compared to those who did not participate. And important in this study, it included populations uh, of older po patients, women, and underrepresented racial and ethnic minority groups, as well as those with heart failure, showing perhaps greater benefit in those populations than in other populations. Another study by Hamill and colleagues also using Medicare data showed a, a dose response uh, to cardiac rehabilitation so that individuals who participated in 36 or more sessions had the greatest benefit, greatest lowering of mortality compared to those who participated at a lower level. So another important step in the uh, underpinnings of cardiac rehabilitation. And then uh, Shannon Dunlay and colleagues, um, this uh, I have to uh, uh, full disclosure, this is from Mayo Clinic a study that we did looking at uh, the impact of rehabilitation participation on um, hospitalization rates, showing a significant drop in cardiac and non-cardiac hospitalization rates in participants who and participants in cardiac rehabilitation after myocardial infarction. Other landmark studies that looked at safety of rehabilitation because there was some concern that exercising patients after a myocardial infarction would be unsafe. Uh, even doing a stress test would be unsafe. And Bob DeBusk, Nancy uh, also showed that that was, that was safe to do as well. But there are other studies, including by Bill Haskell and Steve Van Camp and Pavey from uh, France, showing that uh, in many studies from the 1970s on, that cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction, and death during and immediately after a cardiac rehabilitation session, extremely rare, mainly because of the careful um, screening and application of therapy by professionals in cardiac rehabilitation. Landmark studies for participation. There's a study by Phil Adis and his uh, team from uh, Vermont Phil has done amazing work over many years. He showed that one of the strongest predictors of participating in rehabilitation was a strong referral from a physician who had, who had encouraged the patient to participate. Great study and has been a great part of developing uh, rehabilitation referral efforts over time. Um, also with the group at Stanford, it was our pleasure to carry out a national survey that was published in 1996, demonstrating a large participation gap particularly for women, racial and ethnic minority groups uh, and older patients, uh, important uh, and has been shown around the world as well, happening unfortunately and continuing to happen. Another key uh, landmark study from uh, Sherry Grace and colleagues in Canada, looking at participation rates, very uh, simple and yet powerful study showing that if you apply an automatic referral system in your hospital, and have liaisons or navigators in your hospital helping patients to get to rehabilitation, you could improve referral rates from 32% to 86% and enrollment rates from 29% to 74%. Wonderful study that has really had a huge impact in the practice of cardiac rehabilitation. As far as uh, landmark studies on the economic impact of rehabilitation, Paul O and colleagues in Canada, a very nice study where they looked at uh, system, health system data, utilization, costs, 
for patients with coronary disease who are eligible for rehabilitation, finding that those who had a high level of participation in this darker uh, bar in the bo uh, line in the bottom had a much lower cost per day uh, of utilization costs than those who did not participate as much. And it ended up being a difference of about $10 per patient per day Canadian, which applied over a population is a huge impact for uh, healthcare expenditures. Well, what about uh, healthcare studies? I'm sorry, landmark studies that have looked at innovation. And uh, our colleagues here at the Mayo Clinic, including Ray Squires, looked at a, a trans telephonic ECG monitoring program in 1991 that uh, showed it was safe to carry out for patients with coronary disease. And then, as mentioned, uh, Nancy mentioned uh, Bob Nabusk. And Nancy and some of us were so privileged to be part of this uh, work, the Multivit study, which showed that a nurse case managed system improved smoking cessation rates, LDL cholesterol control, functional capacity, better than the usual care. A landmark study, very, very important study uh, with Bob and Nancy and other forward thinkers in, in the field. I'd like to highlight another study in innovation by Marlene uh, Varnfield and colleagues in Australia that I think has really helped to move things forward in many significant ways. Now we're in the uh, smartphone era. They showed in a very uh, nice study that uh, a smartphone-based study had similar benefits to a, a center-based program looking at uh, walking time, you know, functional capacity improvements, LDL control, and psychological health. Very, very nice study. Uh, they showed that uh, the uptake adherence and completion was uh, stronger in the home-based uh, program. Now, adherence, I think we need to be a little careful on this because certainly it's easier to adhere to a home-based program than having to go into a center. But I think uptake and completion still, very important to look at that, and the comparison is valid. A very important uh, paper to show a new way of doing things. Well, what threats are we facing today in cardiac rehabilitation that may get in the way of further innovation and advance? Uh, we know that cardiac rehabilitation works. Um, applying treatments of known benefit will bring benefits. Uh, that's, that's very clear. So what are the threats to us in the field of cardiac rehabilitation then? Well, I think one of the threats is the status quo, that we have an effective treatment with low utilization rates. There is always difficulty overcoming status quo, and that is a big threat to us. There is resistance to change, which is a little different than that, People who are either in the field or outside the field who may be resistant to doing something new. We can't do that. We as professionals need to lead in change. And if we don't, we'll be left behind. There are competing demands. Healthcare resources are getting tougher and tougher to, uh, um, to find. A rising generation of healthcare professionals are being either um, uh, influence to go into non-science fields, non-healthcare fields, or into other healthcare uh, professions within the healthcare field. How many are coming into cardiac rehabilitation? Are we um, bringing in the brightest and the best from a diverse background? If not, we need to do better. And uh, I would say we do need to do better. Financial challenges will also always be a threat. That's a threat to all of healthcare, uh, but especially in cardiac rehabilitation which has never been a big money maker, but it's a lifesaver. And we need to make sure we make a good case, the business case to show not only the lives we can save and the, the improvements we can bring about, but also the uh, financial and healthcare resources we can more uh, um, wisely use and more valuably use. What about future opportunities for rehabilitation? Well, these are some questions for all of us to consider. How can we expand the utilization of cardiac rehabilitation? Is home-based rehabilitation, smartphone-based rehabilitation the answer? I'm not sure it's the complete answer. It may be part of the answer, and I hope it is, but we need to show that. We need to do more studies to show this. How can we increase the effectiveness or inter interventions? We have a large number of people who are not continuing with the changes they make and many who don't make the changes they need to during cardiac rehabilitation, how can we be even more effective in delivering those interventions? 
how can we expand to additional populations? And this is happening all over the world. Uh, how can we help anyone with heart disease who needs help in a chronic care model to do better? How can we involve the next generation of cardiac rehabilitation professionals? How can we help them to find, find joy and uh, benefit in their full career so they can continue to work with us long-term? What about center-based care, home-based care, hybrid care, you know, both care, which is best? Which is the best model? And I would just say that, you know, we've come from a paradigm where we see uh, here in the small circle, the blue circle in the middle, a small group of people getting traditional rehabilitation in a center-based program, and a large number of people in black not getting any care, to a new paradigm now where we see more patients getting home-based care and hopefully more that will be getting traditional care. But in reality, I see that this will be in the future and even now that there's just more of a mixed picture, a hybrid model where we'll be using all different types of models to make sure we meet the needs of the patients that we have. And there are various needs and we need to have various models to meet those needs. So in, in summary, the foundations for cardiac rehabilitation are strong and we have a rich history of pioneers, research and policy work. The scientific underpinnings strengthen that and help us to, to face the changes in an ever changing world uh, to make sure we have evidence of the benefit, safety, participation, economic impact and innovation that will lead us to new areas. And then uh, being mindful of threats to, to cardiac rehabilitation to make sure we're not part of the threats but that we're part of the solutions. And by doing so, we can help bring future opportunities into reality by advancing past the status quo, expanding the reach of rehabilitation, uh, providing new evidence, better and stronger evidence, and new models to deliver the care that we know the patients so desperately need. So the future of rehabilitation is bright. I, I say this often, there's never been a better time to be a patient in rehabilitation or to be a professional in cardiac rehabilitation. And I look forward to seeing how it will continue to advance into the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. That was an exceptional uh, talk and I'm left with even more thoughts and questions than before you started. Uh, I have opened up the chat and the question and answer session for anyone who has any questions for Dr. Thomas. Um, and while we're waiting for that, I, I actually have a question for, for Dr. Thomas. Uh, we've talked about the giants that have built cardiac rehab to where it is today and, and kind of the different faces and evolution that it's been through. Uh, what would be your one piece of advice for the trainees that are on this call on how to continue to expand upon the work that's been done? Because a lot has already been been done, but we have to you know, be very thoughtful on how we continue to transform. Yeah, it's a great question. I think there are a lot of questions that need to be re-asked and to re be re-answered. Um, I know there's a lot of work looking at, at better ways to deliver exercise uh, therapy, for example. And we have a lot of work to do in nutrition therapy, um, psychological health uh, management, behavior change, maintaining change over time. Those are important to do. Um, so I think, and then of course, with the, uh, the question about delivery of rehabilitation and new models, that there's a, there's a wealth of, of questions still to answer. And for those who are uh, physicians looking at this opportunity, I would say also that I would bring with you not only a passion for uh, prevention and rehabilitation, but also bring with you some other skills. Because to be real honest, you need to be also trained in imaging or in other aspects, perhaps in heart failure or um, in, in congenital heart disease, to have, have a dual uh, specialty, so to speak, that you can bring along with you because you, that'll be helpful to you as you develop professionally. And then I see one question in the question and answer uh, from Miranda saying, she loved your discussion. Um, on needing to recruit great staff and trainees into the profession, but she has seen a big barrier in this being the low wages for cardiac rehab employees. Any advice on how we can tackle this 
so our professionals can make good living wages while still doing great work. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the simple answer, of course, we need to pay them more. But the, the big question is how we, how we do that. And that's where it's going to take um, some key partners um, and uh, armed with uh, important business case data that you can go to your leadership with to show the benefits and the value of what we're doing. And this, this shifts us from reimbursement type um, care to value-based care, right? So that, that's where we need to just show value and make sure we, we provide the uh, reimbursement that, and the salaries that, that they deserve. I agree, it's a big problem and uh, we, we need to do much, much better.